Welcome to another anthropology lecture on the language of the Egyptians, Divine Words, Part 2, um, Lecture 16. We're going to look at a few more features of the Egyptian language, um, and then we're going to take a look at some material that help us think about languages in general, um, particularly from an anthropological point of view. Uh, so grab yourself some pen and paper, and here we go. So far, when we've looked at the Egyptian language, we've seen a set of signs that can either stand for an entire word, which is an ideogram. We've also seen signs that can stand for sounds. So for example, the mouth sign is the one we used the last time. The mouth as an ideogram means mouth, but as a sound or a phonogram, it means R, right? It gives us the sound of R. There are possibilities in Egyptian though for a sign to represent more than one sound. So two sounds at once. Um, and the first group of these are called biliterals. These are signs where the, the ideogram stands for two different sounds that together uh, can be used to make words. Um, the biliterals that you encounter in Egyptian are probably some of the most common hieroglyphs you'll ever see. Um, I'll show you a list of them coming up. But it's also possible in ancient Egyptian for a symbol, an ideogram, to represent three or more sounds. And these are triliterals. Um, I don't know why I went all caps there. It's like I'm yelling at you. These are three consonant sounds. Um, that means that Egyptian has quite a bit of flexibility in its language. Um, because you can use this uh, biliteral or triliteral to stand for the object that it represents as an ideogram, but it can also spell out um, multiple sounds all at once, which is pretty amazing for language, but also pretty confusing for us as language learners, where we would prefer things to just be consistent, that this symbol stands for an R and that's all it ever does. But the Egyptians were de bound and determined not to be limited by that kind of consistency. So there's a table of biliterals and triliterals. Um, so this little ox head here is ka. Um, we've got um, the sun god, re, represented here. Um, the sky pet, um, a famous um, symbol of stability, the jed pillar um, right here. You've got um, the eye, this uh, symbol right here. It kind of looks like a mouth with a circle in it. Ear, ear. Um, D here, um, it's actually... Um, a symbol for a, a bread pot. Um, you've got pear, which is the word for house. All of these can be what they represent. So here, ka, two arms raised up. Looks like we're at a football game, right? Shoots, he scores, goal! Um, that's, that's a particular aspect of a person's um, spirit. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about religion. Um, you also have triliterals. Um, so we've got uh, Nesu here, beat, which together Nesu Biti becomes the name um, for Pharaoh, the name for the king of Egypt. Um, he of the sedge plant and the bee. Um, we are going to encounter Achet, the horizon, where the, the sun is coming up over the horizon. Um, Kefir, which is a beetle, the dung beetle. 
Um, a very common word, nefer, as in Nefertiti, um, the beautiful one has come. Hotep, an offering, which we're going to see today, um, or Hetep. Um, Necher, the symbol for God. Um, Heru, which we'll also see today. All of these symbols are pretty common. Um, it's worthwhile to go ahead and memorize them if you plan on learning Egyptian, because it's just easier if you um, have these things learned and you're not constantly having to look things up. It just is hard to try to do that. Um, if you are thinking, ah, I can just look it up. No, it's, it's a lot easier. And that's a rule, it's a good rule for all language learning. Um, memorizing things makes it available to your working memory so you don't have to think about it while you're also trying to think about something else and then put the two things together. Um, so no shortcuts in ancient Egyptian. Memory is the way to go. Um, keep in mind that biliterals and triliterals may have phonetic complements to help spell out the sounds. So um, you might have an extra symbol in beat to help um, spell out that word so that um, you know that it stands for B-E-T or B-E-E-T. Um, that's how we will say it as beat. The phonetic complements don't get spelled themselves, so you don't write out B um, I I T T like it's doubling the word. Uh, instead, you just know that those are helped to remember to spell out what it says. So if you come across the sign here, the the shenu, um, the cartouche as we call it, which is from the the shen the the symbol or the circle of eternity, just an elongated circle of eternity. Um, you wouldn't spell that out. Um, you would remember the phonetic complements are there to just remind you of, of the spelling of the word. Transliteration is another thing we need to talk about um, because Egyptian is not easy to write in hieroglyphs. Yes, there are fonts you can download, but you've got to memorize a lot in order to even use those fonts and know how to find them. Um, so it's not as easy as like pressing an A on your keyboard and getting the appropriate hieroglyph. Um, Plus, typesetting hieroglyphs, it's, well, at least today it's a lot easier than it used to be. So it's a, very common for um, you to see in books the hieroglyphs transliterated um, into uh, the sounds that they would be in English. And then you can go from there to a translation of what that word actually means. So let's consider this word here. This is ka. It's got two sounds in it that we don't even have in, um, in um, English. So this little glottal stop sound, which might have been more like an L or an R um, in Egyptian. And this outstretched arm, which is also like a ah, very throaty sound. Um, and then a person as the determinative. So whatever this is, it's a person or somebody doing something. And then we have here, um, miu, which if we add to the end of it, the sign for T and this little tail symbol, we get miute. So what do they mean? Well, ka and miu, miute, transliterated, Q-A-A, -A, miu, miute gives us the words to vomit and the word for cat. Um, so you can see this guy has got his hand to his mouth here. So it's determining um, something of relating to a person as, as relating to the mouth. He's throwing up. Actually, you can't get better than to have these sounds here coming out of the throat to represent vomiting, I think. Um, 
Probably though my favorite word has to be Mew because the Egyptians decided to name cats for the sound that they make. So Mew is what they heard cats making, which is not far off from our meow. Um, and if you add a T to the end of an Egyptian word, it makes it feminine. So Mew is a male cat the determinative for cat, and this symbol right here is a T, so we get female cat. Um, keep in mind that when we transliterate or tran and then, then go on to translating, um, we don't write down the determinatives, so we don't translate ka and then write man uh, with hand and mouth. Uh, we don't do that with phonetic complements either, so we don't double the letters. Um, so we just spell it as it is, knowing it's a phonetic complement, and knowing the determinative helps us understand what the meaning is for that word, what is intended for the meaning. We're going to see how this works in an offering formula. So I've got a, um, an offering formula from a tomb, and the point of this is to show you the way the Egyptian language worked, not necessarily to give you the impression that we can suddenly read Egyptian and boom, we're ready to go. Um, though you will pick up some signs and symbols that as they become familiar to you, you'll go, oh, I know what that sign is pointing to or what it means, or at least I have a good idea of what it means. First of all, let's remember how we should read this. What direction should we read this offering formula from? Hmm. Well, home listeners, you look for animals or people and you see what direction they're facing. So they're all facing to the right, to the right, to the right, which means we will start on the right and we read it right to left, top to bottom. If we were to transliterate this to represent it into English sounds or sounds that we know what they mean in English, this is what this offering formula would start off as. Hetef Dinesu Aser Neb Chedu Necher. We could do that for all the texts that we encounter. Um, because it certainly is a lot easier to type all of this out um, than to type the hieroglyphs for it. Even so, you do have to know how to access special characters in your programs. Um, if you've taken Spanish before and French before, you've probably encountered some of these special characters um, in, in typing your Spanish or French responses. So these are found in the symbol section of most word processing uh, programs. And so you just have to find these particular symbols. So this D with an underscore is J, like June. Um, and you have to be able to recognize which, which ones are which, because you remember in Egyptian there's as well as a, a ah and a sound and a ha hard breathing sound. So which, which of these is which? Let's work our way through the offering formula and see if we can pick up some things, not so much about translating and transliterating Egyptian, but understanding a little bit about how the language works from an anthropological point of view, as well as um, what it tells us about the Egyptian way of thinking about their world. Um, the first part of an offering formula is going to be pretty much the same no matter what the offering formula is. Um, an offering the king gives. Hetep dinasut, hotep dinasut. Remember, we don't know what the vowels are, so we just put um, short e's in where we need to. Um, interestingly enough, um, 
This is for gives here, this triangle symbol. Um, and this is the offering. It represents the offering table. So it's a table with offering on it. But notice that our first word, first word is uh, nasut, um, which is the sedge plant, which is standing in for the king. So it's a shorthand for king. Um, and it's first. So instead of saying hetep bin di nasut, it actually says nasut di hetep, which that sh should indicate something to us that's very important. The Egyptian language valued um, placing the most important sign, the most honored sign at the beginning. And that would be like the king or a god. So um, this is an honorific device to say, okay, we can't start this sentence with an offering. We gotta actually put the first thing in the sentence being the king, because who's the most important thing in the society? Um, our second little grouping of signs here is just to Osiris, Usir, um, uh, which we don't usually use W anymore um, to represent that. Uh, we more, more or less go Usir, um, but we just say Osiris when we translate in, um, into English. Next one is where um, we're talking about here. This is Osiris, and um, Osiris is going to get what's called an epithet. Epithets are very common in writings around the world. Um, they are often place names. Um, so this is the person you should know, really important, from X place. Sometimes, in the case of Latin, they're patronymic in nature, um, so they indicate that this person is the son of so-and-so. Um, in the case here of Osiris, we want to remind you, just in case you weren't sure which Osiris we were talking about, we're talking about Neb Jedu. This is a sign for Lord, or Neb. This is the Jed pillar, Jedu. Um, and over here, we see this sort of cross symbol. It's like we suddenly go on X-Men or something. Um, that is the sign for crossroads. And the stroke under it means that we're to interpret that as town or city. So if you ever see this crossroads in a set of hieroglyphs, very likely it's talking about a place. The next is um, Necher Ah. The great god, this is not just any, any god, this is not just Osiris the boring, this is Necher, ah, the great god. And this flag symbol here, probably represented a banner out in front of a temple, um, is our word for Necher, a tri-literal. He's also the lord of um, Abydos, so we've got lord repeated again, Neb. Um, and this spells out um, Abydos here. And once again, town symbol um, to tell us that, you know, this is what we're talking about here, a place, a location, Neb, Abedju. Six is interesting. Um, it's a little complicated. Um, basically interpret it as gives, like this D over here, another word meaning gives, but it really means so that he gives. And this F, this horned serpent, is what's known as a suffix pronoun. You attach it to indicate that this is a male giving. Um, that he personally, uh, this guy, is giving. Um, we won't go into that too in depth, but um, it's an important thing to understand for Egyptian that they don't necessarily do pronouns or nouns the way we do, or adjectives or verbs are really complicated. Um, so keep in mind, languages don't all conceive of um, the construction of time and tense and person and place the way we would. Um, so you might want to keep that in mind if you plan on studying Egyptian in the future. Uh, next one is uh, Pereteru, which is a voice offering. Um, my favorite part right here is this beer, 
this is what's referred to um, by this symbol here because you know what better to get in the afterlife than you know plenty of beer we'll be talking more about food later um, what you will also see in an offering formula is not just who is giving the offering um, to wonder what circumstances what deity is invoked but you also see of course what the actual offering itself is um, and so not surprisingly there are a list of things multiple things and these strokes down here represent the way Egyptians multiply something um, so if you put three strokes underneath it's just simply saying there's more than one an uncountable number at this point we don't know exactly how many but clearly more than one. Um, the Egyptians do have other numbers uh, that they can use. Um, so common, many times commonly in these uh, formulas for an offering, you'll see a thousand um, as, as the number used. So this is a voice offering. Um, what is the offering? Well, it's bread, ox, fowl, te, ka, apid. Now, the notice that the Egyptians don't have commas and they don't have conjunctions to link these together to say it's a thing of bread and it's an ox and it's a fowl. So for the Egyptians, it wasn't necessary to add what we would consider important to have, commas and conjunctions. You just simply list the things and then the context spells out that this is a list of offerings. And here it is, three things in a row. But it's also alabaster and linen, um, shes, menhet. And then this is for the ka of ken. So this is an offering the king gives on behalf of uh, the ka, the spirit, and ka en. And then the end of the offering is going to tell us whose ka this offering is for. Now, before we tell you that, think about that. We've just made an offering to Osiris for the spirit of this person. The king gives for this person's spirit. That should tell you that offerings are important to Egyptians. After people die, there is a need to give them, to give their spirit an offering. So keep in mind, we're gonna talk more about that later, but that should be a little bit of a window into the way they think. Now this interesting pot, looking like it's shooting out silly string on a, on a leg, is uh, the wab, the priest, uh, the pure one. Um, and so this symbol here with the three water signs just means wab, the wab priest or the pure one. And then 12 is going to be the name of this person, many. How do we know it's a person? We have a determinative telling us this is who he is. And 13 and 14 are, again, epithets. Um, or descriptors for this particular priest. This is many who is true of voice, ma heru, um, or justified is how we often translate true of voice. Um, and finally, owner of reference or, or lord of reference, um, med imach. The point of all of this was to show you, one, how this system works, how the space is organized, but two, to impress upon you the need for understanding the context of what's going on here. And that's going to be an important point as we wrap up our look at language here in the second lecture. Languages have syntax. Egyptians got syntax. There are ways to arrange words to form sentences. Things follow other things, just like English has syntax. Latin has syntax. You use arrangement of words to convey meaning. 
And so we have to understand when we're trying to get into the head of people through their language, what their syntax says about what's important to them and about word order um, and what that implies in terms of the meaning. Egyptian, just like every other language, has what's called pragmatics or the context that helps determine the meaning. It's an interaction between the text and the reader. Cultures don't feel the need to spell out every single thing because it's like everybody in that culture knows what that is. So if I walked into ancient Egypt, what's up? They wouldn't have any context for that. It wouldn't mean anything to them. The interaction between me and them would be fraught with difficulty because the pragmatics of my knowledge of sup um, doesn't line up to their, their ways of greeting and understanding each other. Um, this has led a lot of scholars to think about the ways in which language structures meaning in the world. Um, this is known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis which says that our perception of our world, our understanding of our world is coded by the language we use. The choices of our words help structure our understandings of meaning. Um, probably the most strict interpretation of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis would say that language literally shapes our, our view of the world. We can't think outside of the language. Some scholars would push back on that and say, well, maybe language, there's room for language to shape your view or code your understanding of the world, but not necessarily limit you. Um, but I'll give you some examples to help you think about this. The gendering of nouns is a great example of language. In English, we don't gender our nouns um, as much as we used to. I mean, we used to th say things like um, chairman of the board. Of course, now we say chairperson to replace the assumption there that the chairman always has to be a man. Um, we used to have actor and actress. Well, no, an actor, male or female, is a person who acts in a movie, so we don't need actress. Um, but many other languages around the world do assign gender to their words. So, for example, in Latin, the word city is feminine. Countries are feminine. And so that seems to color the perception of places um, in that language as being, in some ways, feminine in nature. Um, Another way to think about this is how many words do we have for a particular concept? Um, a big one in, um, in sort of American history circles is to stop using the word slave and use the word enslaved instead. Because slave says it's a person in a condition, enslaved, points to the fact that that person was put into that condition by another human being. And our choice to use enslaved versus slave indicates something about our understanding of the world and our structuring of our perceptions of the world. Well, that's been our look at um, language um, and with an example from ancient Egyptian. I'll see you next time.